Cody Alexander match quarters. One of the most difficult things about getting into football is learning the defensive language or even the offensive language of what you're trying to learn. A lot of times we're given playbooks. There's not a lot of glossaries or indexes for us to go off of. Offensively, a lot of route combinations are kind of considered the same. You can talk to a West Coast guy and an air raid guy. You can talk to an air Coriel guy or even uh, kind of just random uh, smatterings of offensive guys. And for the most part, they're able to kind of talk power is power, counter is counter, ISO is ISO, uh, you know, zone is zone. And so for a lot of times, uh, it's the semantics in offense that can get you kind of into trouble. But the overall arcing kind of concepts that we go over are kind of known if i say dagger for most of you you know what i'm talking about why cross if i say smash uh, these are all concepts that most people are familiar with but when it comes to defense it can be really really difficult to kind of wade your in, way into the waters it's almost like jumping into the deep end hopefully you can swim and figure it out and so for a lot of people that's where it kind of stops i think one thing you know obviously offense is what puts butts in the seat for football people want to see scoring it's exciting uh, but I think a lot of times people just aren't interested in defense because it's really hard to get into so today we're going to talk about the language of football primarily focusing on the defensive side and kind of how we can go about making it a better ecosystem for everybody you know that's one of the goals that I've had at match quarters is kind of being the Rosetta Stone of defense I've talked to a lot of people about that of like I just want to learn as much as I possibly can from as many different uh, from as many different places as I can so that at some point we can come and meet together in some language. I can speak to anybody about defense. That's kind of always been the goal about Match Quarters is because it's an educational website. That's how I've always looked at it, and that's how I want it to be. Um, and so today we're talking about defense, primarily focusing on language, and then how you can build that language. Because I think whether you are a fan or you are a coach and you've been coaching for decades, always hearing about new ideas or even ways of building language and how you can approach different things, especially when, hey, I want to learn about this system. How do I get into this system? And then relating it back to you. Because at the end of the day, everything is about distilling information into digestible bites so that people can get into football. Football is the greatest sport in the world. I want to make sure that it continues to go on. I love watching my two boys play and I love the joy that they have when they play the game. So let's get into it. Thanks for joining me for another Match Quarters, The Art of X Show. Let's talk about language. As stated, we're talking about building a football language. One of the biggest problems that we face is the words that we use, whether they are jargon or they are just basic words that most people understand. The problem with jargon is that a lot of people don't understand the word. It's only for a small section of who we're talking to or the audience, or it's the, just only for coaches, right? We hear this is almost coach speak right that's what we hear about when we hear co when we hear journalists and other people talk about oh well that coach talked about this oh that's just coach speak so words matter what is jargon special words or expressions that are used by a particular profession we're talking about coaching or group and are difficult for others to understand. This would be essentially words that are kind of guarding the gate, right? This is gatekeeping, right? We're only using, uh, maybe I only use words that uh, people that follow Saban know or Aranda know. Um, a lot of times these are going to be really technical terms that uh, at, at really at the end of the day don't mean anything. I think genius is found in being able to explain to, to people uh, like it's they're a fifth grader, right? So what are the different types of jargon that we have? We have technical jargon can only be understood by certain groups of people. This is typically where we see jargon. It's going to be in uh, how we are, you know, the technical piece of it, how you're teaching your three technique, how you're teaching your Mike linebacker, how you're teaching your DBs or coverage terms that, uh, for instance, like if you say for I call, uh, for instance, any kind of overload by where we set all, all the defensive linemen on one side, I call that boss. Some people call that load other people just call it a load front it's it's just different ways of saying things uh, but it's always important to then be able to explain what it is so boss stands for bigs on same side it's kind of like an acronym for an overload or, or a loaded front 
office. So this is used in interpersonal communication within a staff where the words are only have meaning within the group. These are things that are team specific. These are things that are system specific that only people within that system actually understand. Technical terms are kind of these general terms that you have that are only focused on the technical aspects of football. Office jargon is used only in specific places. This is the classic coach at a clinic that talks as a, the clinic speakers going, raises his hand and says, well, at my school, we talk about, we say this. Okay, that's great. But the speaker doesn't speak your language because he's not in the office on a day-to-day -day basis. So a technical office, those typically are what you're going to find a lot of time. And then buzzwords. These are popular words that we hear at a specific time. Like right now, a popular buzzword is like escort. What is an escort screen? What is an escort motion what is an escort play all of these things those are a popular thing within uh, within offense and if you're not necessarily in the know you could be like okay what is escort i have no what that idea that it is in fact i was talking to a coach the other day i said escort and they thought it was something completely different than what i was actually talking about so it's always important to make sure you check for understanding again when you approach people and you're talking about football even for myself i'm always coming at the aspect of like check like I'm a classroom teacher, check for understanding. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Make sure I repeat it in different, and I try to repeat, especially technical jargon, uh, it, you know, at least three different times in three different ways. So that way I'm, I'm making sure that anybody that's following along understands what we're talking about. So a buzzword is a word or phrase jargon that is fashionable at a particular time or in a particular context. Context. This could be an acronym. This could be, uh, you know, right now too, a lot of the attack react or react attack you hear a r r a you know pete jenkins stuff that's kind of really popular right now especially within the defensive lineman world and so you might come across that and have no idea exactly what that means so jargon and teaching is is something that is actually pretty commonplace coaching is teaching and i think for a lot of coaches we lose out on that because we think teaching is only in the classroom i think for a lot of people that are looking in they don't necessarily understand that hey at the end of the day coaching and teaching are synonymous Anonymous. They're the exact same thing. I always viewed myself as a teacher of football. That's what I was teaching. And I love teaching that. Um, and that's why I'm running match quarters. So coaches teach players who are non-experts. And I think a lot of coaches lose out when they don't necessarily look at their players as non-experts. They are assuming that because they are there, they have a helmet on shoulder pads on, that they are then going to be able to communicate with them. Great coaches understand that everybody around them, other than the people within the office, are probably non-experts. And there's probably non-experts in the office. So coaches teaching players must understand that they are non-experts. The words that we use should have meaning and relatability. If they don't have meaning and relatability, then we are just talking into, into the air and people are not understanding. It's going over their heads. Players, again, are not experts. If the goal is to create deep understanding of technical terms, then coaches need to create a language that conveys that. We have to find ways that are going to be relatable to our players. You will hear this all the time, relatable and likable. Use same as principles. These are the exact same things that are being told in the classroom. When you are talking to a teacher, when an administrator is talking to a teacher, a curriculum and instruction uh, you know, admin is talking to a teacher, how are are we making this relatable back to the to our students how are we making it at least likable into the fact that they are not you know they're not jumping for joy to be in the classroom and learning math but or even for me I was a, a history teacher but how can I relate that back to their lives and make it at least uh you know where it's likable for them to learn the language you may use in the office needs to be distilled down and match your players comprehension the way that you approach your freshman or your uh your um junior high players is going to be much different than that senior who's been in your program for four or five, six, seven plus years. That is completely different. 
Um, you know, one of the great examples of this is when I was at Midlothian in my very first year, I had a bunch of freshmen and sophomores. The way that we approach game planning, the way that we approach practice in year one was completely different than the way that we approached it in year three. And a lot of times for coaches, when they move on to another place, is that they want to take where they were left off at that point. So I was in year three. You know, we were very advanced and very technical in the way and we could talk. We could use jargon with each other because we understood what we were talking about we could use buzzwords with each other because we understood what we were talking about we had created our own language but when i went to horn those kids had no idea what i was talking about you almost have to start over at the top so going back to year one i think that's one of the lessons that a lot of young coaches learn is that as we go through coaching, the, I can't go back into, you know, year four of my install for a year one program when I'm when I'm moving to a new program or I'm at a different place. Or when we lose, you know, three out of four guys in the secondary, the one guy I can get really technical with, but everybody else is going to need to basically start back at the beginning. And so I think that's important, too, is, as for coaches is understanding, again, players are non-experts. It's kind of the... the I call it the 10-80-10 rule, right? 10% of, of your players that you have are probably never going to get right. They're not going to play. They're probably eventually going to quit. It's just, it's a game of attrition. That's just where it is. 80% of your players are in a bell curve, right? They're right in the middle of the bell curve. And then you're going to have about 10% of the players that you interact with that they are going to show up with their lunch pail every day. They are going to be nerdy about football. They want to get in depth with it. They want to learn everything about it. And this is their life. This is what they love. Those are the people that you need to feed, right? You, your job as a coach is to get that, that that 80 percent on the positive side of the bell curve that's what your job should be and the way to do this is to treat them as non-experts understand that they're probably never going to be an expert in this but i've got to get them to prepare and to participate on friday saturday or even sunday night so i need to make sure that i am pushing them in the positive and the way that you can do that is to when you are teaching these things is approach them as a non-expert quit using jargon and create and build a language that is likable and learnable and has meaning to the players that you have so inverse i want to learn right so this is where a lot of times we miss out is that we are so anchored a lot of times in where we began it could e either be you know i only played high school football these are the only words that i know because i was uh, these this is the what i lived in for four years uh, for other people it could be i learned this system as a coach this is the system that i'm anchored in i mean for me, I really, when I learned football was with Phil Bennett at Baylor. So a lot of the concepts that I talk about that I, that I'm anchored in uh, are built within that four, two, five quarter system that we were there. Now, as I've gone along, I've wanted to learn other things. I've wanted to change the way that I view football. So I've had to try and learn new systems. How do you do that? When trying to learn a new system, it is important to understand the language. So if I'm going to learn Saban, I'm going to learn Aranda, I'm going to learn Venables, I'm going to learn Fangio, all of these things that I am going to learn or I want to learn, even Haycock at Iowa State. I'm just kind of throwing names of popular coaches that people are like, I want to learn this system. It is under it is important to first learn the language. I think a lot of young coaches just want to grab the playbook and say, hey, look, I have this playbook, right? But then they forget that really the technical piece, those those words, those little phrasing and, and how things are, are supposed to be run, those technical terms of, of stunts or paths or coverages, that, that is only a word. That is not the teaching behind it or the meaning behind it. You really have to dig in. You have to go explore. You have to go ask. Glossaries are also not always available along with the teaching tools. I think a lot of times, again, people get these playbooks and they're like, oh, cool, this playbook. And then they have all these words. But it's, I mean, it could be just like reading hieroglyphics, right? Like if you don't understand and you don't have a glossary, and I think it's important for coaches when you want to uh, teach what you're doing or you want to project what you're doing doing out into the universe, make sure that you have a little bit of empathy for those people that are not in the office with you that don't understand your system. Again, this is your system that you're trying to teach to other people or that you're putting out there. Remember, you're the expert. 
not the people that you're trying to teach it to. So again, anytime you approach like your players, again, they are not experts. When you're trying to learn something, it you should it should build empathy for other people trying to learn your system or when when you're talking football with other people. I think that's why one trying to learn something new or learn a new system every year is really important because I think it builds that empathy towards other people, right? That, okay, when I'm teaching this, you may not understand. Let me meet you in the middle. What are words that we know that that are common and then we can build on that? Or can I explain this in a different way? I think too many times we have people that are trying to uh, kind of put things out there and then it's like, well, if you don't know, then you know you can just figure it out. And to me, that's not the way that you want to approach it. And that's not how you would want somebody approaching you when you're trying to learn something new, because look, it's impossible to know everything. Right. So it, it, you want to challenge yourself each each year to learn something new. And so build empathy for other people who are trying to do the same thing. When thinking about how you might want to build a system, think, how am I going to teach it? And I think there's a lot of people primarily right now. Uh, we're we're in March. Right. March of 2024, people right now are getting closer and closer to spring practice. Right. We're getting closer to OTAs in, in the NFL. We're getting closer to the draft. So people are starting to project what are things going to look like. People are in the office right now creating their install plans in their football school and kind of going through all of that, getting closer and closer to the spring. So a lot of people right now are are exploring how they want to build a system. And so when you build a system, the first thing you have to understand is how am I going to teach it? So when we are learning systems and when we are building them, we need to one, look and, and leave context clues and then also what are called visual cues. So what is a context clue? Hints that the author gives to help define a difficult or unusual word. So these are things like that you would see on playbooks is, uh, these would be the paths, right? Not just putting a label behind a player and saying, rip. What is a rip? Drawing it up. These are context clues. Also kind of along with it, if it's a pressure, what are the uh, what are the other movements within the pressure? These are all context clues. Uh, coverages, like where is the safety aligned? How is the corner playing? What are the draw? Like all of these create context clues for, and, and if you use visuals that allow, that really helps other people learn how that is working and then how you can teach this to your players. I love what are called visual cues. They're used to convey meaning and information by engaging the sensory cortex dedicated to human vision. Okay. You can either have this be a symbol, right? Um, I love using symbols on playbook slides. Okay. Cause it just kind of ties everything together. It could be a picture of something. It could be a gesture. These could be words. This could be the sign language. All defenses have some sort of sign language. All offenses typically have some sort of sign language as well. These are all, these are, again, these are visual cues or a word that creates an image in the brain. So I'm really big on visual cues. Um, the, the building words that have meaning that give visuals in the brain and then following along with some sort of symbol, picture, or gesture so that the kids understand it. A lot of times at practice anymore, you know, most people are not having marathon practices like they used to. They kind of understand that we want to keep our players fresh. We want to keep them, you know, bright uh, and having a three, three and a half hour practice a lot is just not going to work. In most cases, uh, going over two hours is usually anything after two hours is usually just going to degrade what you're trying to do. You're, you, you're usually just wasting time. So trying to keep everything within two hours. Well, when you do that, you're limiting time, meaning that you're, you've got to have a quicker processing way of teaching. And so a lot of times these visual cues uh, will give you that, a gesture. Hey, somebody makes a mistake, you give them a gesture like, hey, remember, cap, cap, we want a cap, you know, just kind of something like that. Or, oh, hey, hey, here's a word for this. Or, hey, this is the call that we're making. Hey, this is what I need from you on this. And giving that visual cue along with the verbiage usually brings them along. So let's pivot. Let's start talking about building building a system, large scale, small parts. Remember the pyramids are just a collection of smaller stones. Okay. Yes. Are they large stones? Yes. But they are smaller 
than the pyramid. The pyramid is not just cast out of stone. It wasn't just it wasn't just chipped out of granite, right? So the pyramids are a collection of smaller stones. So how do you build a pyramid? How do you build a large scale playbook? How do you build a large scale system? It's built with small parts inside. So just think about like the human body or anything within an ecosystem. It is starts with a small, right? The human body is built up of uh, you know millions of cells, right? And then it has from there they create organs, and from those organs organs work together, they create the human body, right? So pyramids, again, are a collection of smaller stones. Small parts create large concepts. These small parts are going to be your technical pieces. Once you place them all together, you can then create one holistic way of doing something. So let's say that once I get all of the different techniques and the blitz pass one and the coverage the coverage tags behind it, all of those things are placed together, then I can move into a one word call for that pressure. So small parts allow you to have large scale concepts. To understand the whole, you must start with what makes up the scheme, which is the technical piece. Remember, techniques build the scheme the scheme does not build the techniques it, they, i think too many people go the other way they want the scheme or the playbook to then tell them what to do it's the techniques and the better you can be at the fundamentals the better that you can you can scale what you're trying to do i call it interchangeable parts and we'll talk about it here in a second how do we get to one word calls I think that's the goal for a lot of people. Can I get this down into a one word call? In fact, I always challenge myself to try and get everything down to a one word call so that it could be learn and have it learnable by everybody from the seventh grade team all the way up to my seniors. And the way that you can do that, again, is building pieces out, right? I want techniques, techniques then build the scheme that scheme can then be distilled into one word so you know the best example of this is to go over a pressure so i'm going to go over my allen pressure which is an a gap blitz it's an a gap simulated pressure by the back by the backer away from the back or the back to the three techniques so again this is how we're doing this we're going to get into an over front so visually how are we going to look at this imagine that you have a y off the back is away from it. So we're really just looking at the box. So we have a slanted, we have a slanted backfield. We are going to set the three technique to the tight end. So the tight end is on the defense's left. He's in a slotted position. We're going to set the three technique there. We're going to have a G away from it. So a two I away from it. And then, so we have a five, a three, a two I and a five. Our backers are going to be in thirties. How do I get to Allen? Well, Allen is a collection of different techniques. We are going to run a wedge. Okay. We are going to run a wedge to the call side. So the mic is the one that's going to go. He is on the left. He is going to give a wedge call. So wedge just means that we are going to get a read pop stunt off of the off of the blocking if we get two base blocks right if we get zone we get base block the defensive end is going to pop and the tackle is going to work to contain if we get it down down meaning that we're most likely going to get some sort of gap scheme uh if the back and the, the tight end are away that's usually going to be some sort of power uh then we are going to then surf with the defensive end and the tackle is going to pin so it's just kind of a communication piece the mic then is going to blitz on a cross. So we have our cross, the technique. So Allen is a cross technique to the backer on the three on the wedge side or where the three technique is. So we are going to wedge to the three technique. What we've done is we have taken like split field coverage principles and we've done it for our blitz structure as well. Okay. The nose needs to get out of the way of the pressure the mic is coming to the center he needs to get out of the way of the pressure so he's going to have a knob that's nose to be so even within your language you can create visual cues wedge defensive end and the tackle are going to step or they're going to wedge the they're going to wedge the tackle and they're going to read the tackle the nose has a knob nose to be so he's going to and it's outside step knob outside step so it's nose to be we're getting there cop contain pressure he's going to get the five technique away from the three technique is going to cop he's going to have contain on top of that we can run any coverage we want in, in the what in in the back end now where i'm a quarters guy so we're going to run quarters in the back 
in the back end. The defensive end, if this is a money down or a third down, we can give them a money sign and he knows he's the three drop. So that means he's just checking three and he's going to work with three. Here in this instance, the defensive end is right in front of him. I mean, the tight end is right in front of him. So if the tight end flash is flat, he can either give a push call and climb or he can grab it we, depending on the covers that we play. Uh, so how, how can we get into a one-word call? What does all of this mean? Well, the D end away from the strength equals cop. Okay, that's an automatic in Allen. Wedge to the strong side. Okay, we've already put that in. Wedge D in only drops. It's an obvious pass set. That's the money down. So otherwise, he's just going to fold in for first light. The wheel linebacker who's opposite, he's just tracking the back. So this is a way that we can get a bunch of different technical terms, and we've built a simulated pressure, and we've built a one we're call. When I say Allen, we know we're attacking the A-gap. The, Mike, the backers know that wherever the three technique is sit, I'm the one crossing the face of the center. That's why we call it a cross technique. The other one has the running back. Okay, we know that the cop is going to come away from the three technique and the wedge is going to go to the three technique. So we've created a bunch of different ways in a bunch of these technical terms. All these small parts create one word call. So all of these small parts, it, I'm not saying, hey, wedge knob. OK, I'm not I don't want to say that wedge knob cross four. Right. I don't want to say that. That's that's a lot. Right. So or or even go, uh, you know, we want to we want to go to the tight end. So you go closed wedge cross knob like i you know four right that just takes a lot of time and now all yes and there is an argument and you will hear this from nfl guys like especially the offensive guys where they will just list out a paragraph and every single word is telling somebody what to do but i think a lot of times uh, the, there's a need for distilling that down and the way that you can do that is creating one more calls and taking techniques and taking these certain things and so but you cannot jump forward. You have to start at A and you got to go to Z. You got to go through all the alphabet in between. So you have to teach these technical pieces before you can get to the one word calls. But how I think one word calls make it a lot simpler is that when you do these one word calls, you're essentially building out where interchangeable parts. Okay. These kids are taking interchangeable parts to build one word calls. So the language of football, I think it's very, very complex. And we, a lot of times coaches make the game a lot harder than it needs to be. Each call within a system has its own set of rules, right? Most coaches will place light concepts into buckets. This could be a five man pressure. This could be a fire zone. It could be off of coverages, which a lot of times now we're seeing a lot of people with coverages. So this is our fire zone package. This is our half field zone package. This is our Tampa two package. This is our cover three package. Uh, this is our bonus drop package. This is our drop eight package, right? We're just putting them into buckets. Buckets can be broken into specific tasks. So it could even be, Hey, these are going to be all of our pressures attacking the back. This is going to be all of our pressures attacking the tight end. It could be anything from coverage buckets to uh, direction buckets. Uh, this is all of our field pressures. These are all of our boundary pressures. Uh, this You could even go into pressure pad. These are all of our, uh, this, you know, four man rush. This is our simulator. This is going to be our uh, five man pressures, six man pressures, right? And maybe six man pressures are your hot pressure. So now we just determine this is a hot, this is man, right? So you've got to be able to put these in buckets. When you do that, then you can give them names, right? So for me, I've always tried to keep it simple so that I can catalog these and then, then people can go and find them, especially on my Twitter. So quarterbacks tend to be simulated pressures, five man pressures are basketball teams, six man pressures are countries. Uh, so like I've tried to create a different way of labeling these things out. Not that, you know, it's just what I call them, but it, I've done that so that I can catalog them and then I can find them. And then two, it, it relates it back to y'all that are listening. It's like, okay, well, I want to know what I want to see clips of this Allen pressure. You literally can go on Twitter at the underscore coach underscore a, you can go on Twitter, type in my handle, and then in parentheses type Allen, and you'll come up with a whole bunch of clips. Right. That's why I label it that way. And what I don't want to do is is label it the way that, you know, maybe uh, the 2018 Georgia playbook labels it because one, they've already changed the names for that. And two, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. The only time that you want to use things is uh, like jargon like that is when it becomes common knowledge. So a lot of times like the NFL simulated pressures that the Saban system has, I'll just use the name for that because, you know, that's I think that's pretty commonplace for a lot of people to understand. 
Um, and, and so when you're talking to people, that's the thing. Like Rip Liz, if you were just to go walk into your grocery store, the next person would be like, hey, can you explain Rip Liz match to me? They'd have no idea what you're talking about. But you walk into a coaching office and you say Rip Liz, and pe most people will be like, oh, yeah, that's like Saban's match three stuff. Yeah, they may not know every single technical piece of that because let's be honest, it's, it's Nick Saban, so it's not simple. Um, so, uh, But you can at least start there, right? Okay, let's have a conversation about Rip Liz. Uh, okay, let's have a conversation about match three. Now you have a common ground to start from. So that's a lot of times when things become common knowledge within within a system, you can use those. Uh, but you know, you want to create buckets to break these things down uh, and then tasks are then broken down into specific techniques. So you're distilling your one word call Allen, right? To wedge to the three technique, knob away. It's a cross technique to the linebacker on the, in the three technique. And then from there, what is the coverage piece and how are we, how are we reacting? Um, I think the most important piece, and I cannot stress this enough to anybody listening to this, technique over scheme. And typically, you want to start at the playbook, right? I want the playbook. Give me the playbook. Give me, give me the, I want, I want Saban's playbook, right? I want, give me that. I want, uh, you know, I want Mike McDonald's playbook. Can, do you have that? Can I grab that? Uh, can I look at it? The Fangio playbook. Can I look at it? A lot of times these playbooks are the skeleton. It's not the meat right? It's not the meat and the skin, right? It's not the covering. It's not everything. It's just a skeleton that coaches use as a base. You know, unless you're in the office, you don't necessarily know everything. This is like sitting in a calculus class without learning basic multiplication and division first. Is it, okay, you want calculus? Here's the playbook. Go figure it out on your own without film, without anybody to ask. A lot of times that's not what you want. You want to understand the fundamental language, before you get into the playbook language, right? What are they asking? What are these specific tags? What are these specific techniques? What is in your language attack react? What in your language is react attack? Because I've even talked to people where those two Pete Jenkins terms, who's a legendary defensive line coach, and he's kind of really popular right now uh, in the defensive line world. Those techniques, I have had people tell me two different completely things that, that in fact flipping them that react attack in one language when i go and talk to the next person that's their attack react so i think it's important too to make sure that we are talking the same language and expressing what does it mean to you because for instance another great example i don't like to use the word shuffle because i think it means clicking your heels so i use the word slide not everybody uses slide uh, some people call it a kick step inch step. Um, I call it a proactive step. A lot of people call it a peer step. So it's it really important, again, to understand where they're coming from. And then when you don't know the term, don't just shut down, right? You need to ask, okay, what, what does that term mean to you? Can you show it to me? Can you explain it to me? And then on inversely, when people come to you and ask you for that knowledge, is to not get defensive and build a wall. They're trying to learn that system. Again, learning other systems builds empathy um, if you're a fan just understand that this is going to take this is a process and the first part that you want to start is watching the different techniques and how people are moving together find the geometry within football football is all about math right defense is especially about math how are we getting plus numbers how am i creating uh boxes and triangles within coverage and even in the run fits is how are we leveraging things how are we doing certain things are we setting the front a certain way to create spacing are we setting the secondary where's the nickel set are we protecting the nickel by setting the three technique to him? Are we an odd front? Are we an odd front team? Are we an even front team? How those anchor points all set up the blocking to diversify a scheme. You need to have deep understanding of the techniques required. So if you want to just run the basics, sure, that's great. Then you don't have to get into the nitty gritty of the techniques. But if you want to really build out, right, you want to get creative. You want to get 
you want to diversify. You need to understand the techniques because this is where the same as principles come in, right? Same as principles and interchangeable parts. Even though we may run cover three and cover four, there is a little bit of carryover in some of these techniques. It's just what are, we're doing a little bit different things in the back end. So you still, you must be expensive somewhere. And so when we're building these systems, which is what we're talking about, is that you have to be expensive somewhere. You have to hang your hat on something. And typically, Typically, it's going to be a front structure. We are an odd front team. And then you're going to go to a secondary structure. We're an odd front team that run that bases in cover three. Okay. Those are going to be, these are our foundational parts. This is where, these are our pillars, right? We are going to be a simulated pressure team. So we're an odd front. We are a uh, cover three base, and we are going to be a simulated pressure team, meaning that we are going to blitz four on most of the time. You could be on the, you know, another one. We are going to be an even front team. We are going to be a quarters base team, and then we are going to blitz uh, five at, at all times, right? So we're a five-man pressure team. And so building off of that, who are you going to be? Simple versus simplistic. Now, I if you are... Uh, if you have never heard or you have never watched some of my coverage stuff, this is one of the my first slides that I go over last year when I did my coverage, uh, my coverage pod series over the summer was I want to define what simple and simplistic is because I think a lot of people think simple is simplistic and that's not the case. Simple is easily understood. I've distilled the language down to where non-experts can understand what I'm talking about. Simplistic is treating a complex issues and problems as if they were much simpler than they appear. That is like saying uh, that is making things so distilled that you can't, you can't come back from that, right? Like we can't build off of that. This is just who we are. We run box to everything. We're just a spot drop box team. We just run box to everything. We never change. And, and we're just going to keep it simple, right? Uh, or keep it simple. Simple is just easily understood, right? We don't want to make things simplistic. We just want to make them simple to learn. So start small and build. Again, pyramids are just small blocks built together, put together to create a large pyramid, right? Regardless of the approach, start with the basics, right? We want to start with the fundamentals. I tell young coaches all the time, start with the fundamentals and then you can get weird. Right. You want to go do all this creative stuff. You want to go do all this stuff. You can't do any of that creative stuff unless you have the fundamentals down. I think a lot of where does creativity stem from? Creativity stems from exploration within the basics. Right. OK, we have all these basics. I understand the basics. I'm an S expert in the basics. Now we can start exploring different ways of mixing and matching these things. We can create hybrid coverages. We can create hybrid fronts. We can create hybrid run fits. Right. We can do certain things that, you know, a lot of times if we were an if then or black and white world, we couldn't do that. So if you want to be creative, you have to start with the fundamentals. The player's floor will always be their technique. So if you're trying to get your players to be better, then teach them better techniques, get even better at the technical stuff, right? Get better at the fundamentals. Then you can grow your scheme. I, again, it's not, you don't just start with like, for instance, if you're going to plant an oak tree in front of your house, you don't go get the 100 year oak and plant it right in your yard. That's impossible. You have to go get a smaller tree and you got to water it. You got to let it grow. You got to prune it. You got to make sure it grows big. You know, the growth that you're constantly keeping track of it and you're growing and growing and growing. And then, and then you can have that hundred year old, right? Then a then hundred years later, your grandchildren and, and their grandchildren are looking at this tree and how massive it was, but it started as a little sapling. Again, you have, if you want to grow big things, you have to start with the technical part first. I think a lot of people want to jump to the end. And that's just not, that's just, you can't do that. When creating a system, it is important to define what you want to be. And I think that's the other part too, is that a lot of people want to do everything, right? Well, you can't do everything, right? It's like saying that I, you, you can learn everything about football, right? That's impossible. I, there, there's things that I have no idea about, uh, you, you know, like, uh, like uh, some of this, like uh, I get asked all the time about like double wing stuff. And I'm like, I have no idea. I've never even seen it. Uh, I've no, I have no experience with that at all. Um, and I think that that's important, like being able to be, to, to say, I don't know enough about that to make a comment on it. You know, I think a lot of people in this world, we all want to be experts. We want to be experts. In, be an expert in what you know, define it really well. I, 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 you know, I tell young coaches all the time, and I've said this before, 
Learn the system you're in, become an expert in it. Once you become an expert in it, then go learn new things. Then you're going to try and prove what you learned wrong. And that's how you get better every year. I mean, the language that I used in 2019 when I left Midlothian is not the same language that I use right now. A lot of the same terms are, are the same, but I've learned so much in four or five years. Right. Um, and so when I started coaching at, at Baylor in tw at 2011, what I learned there, that system, you know, even coach Bennett would tell you that there's going to be different things that we're going to be doing. Like you, if you're doing the exact same thing you did 10 years ago and you haven't tried to make it better and you haven't tried to change, then you're probably stuck. Right now, there's going to be coaches out there of like, look, I've had the same installs for 10 years. I've done this. I've done that. I've done that. Then let's look at your kids because I bet you have really good kids. OK, and, and just understand that ecosystems change. And so if you're not trying to change, at least you're not trying to make things better. You're not trying to adjust. Then one day you will get fetched. And that's just the bottom line is that all dynasties end, all people get caught. Like it doesn't matter. So example, here's an example of start small and build. We are an odd front team that bases in cover three, right? I said that earlier uh, and run simulated pressures, right? There's our example. All you got to do is define what you want to be. And then we are going to be technically sound at all of that stuff. We are going to be a tight front base. Okay. Then my four eyes are going to know everything they need to know about a four eye, right? My nose is going to be the best lag nose. If we put him in a shade, he's going to be the best shade nose. My linebackers are going to have the best A to C fits. They're going to know when their indicate where their when their indicator keys are. We're going to be we're going to work. We're going to know. We know exactly what we're going to do. Our footwork's going to be great. Our we're going to be simulated pressures. What does that mean? Let's carry a few that we need. Right, engage the jack, engage the nickel. You know, have an edge pressure for your mic and your wheel. Have an internal pressure for your mic and your wheel. Those are things that you need, okay? We're going to get really, really good at that. We're going to be a, a ripless match team. Great. We're going to get really, really good at that and have all the adjustments off of it. Then when we want to do something else, we can build off of that technical base. Uh, create an inventory. I think, to me, I had never done this, and I had never thought about it. And then when I, when I was at life school, and a lot of my players really had never played football uh, before their freshman year. So there's not a lot. And a lot of them, you know, had not really played that much just in particular. So when I had to then sit down and decide how are we going to teach all of these, these things to these, to these kids that don't have a, a high football IQ, I, st I was like, look, the best way to do this is I'm just going to make a list of everything that we've got. Right. And then you make this list. You have a list of your base fits. You have a list of your, your single movements, right? Then we want to have our two-man line stunts and three-man line stunts. Then I want to have, I'm going to have all my, I call them creepers. Some people call them simulated pressures. You can have it however you want. I call them, I call them creepers just to make it easy. Um, some people literally, they're, they're, you know, you can get into the semantics of creeper versus, versus simulated pressure. Some, uh, but a lot of people are just putting them in one bucket and calling them simulated pressures, right? So you have your simulated pressures. Okay. We have our passing sims that we're only going to use. We have our packages, how we're going to then beat basically blitz the formation, five man pressures and our hot pressures. Well, I mean, I can come up with 20 different hot pressures. The problem that we run into is then I have to call all those hot pressures. You have to run them at some point, right? Five-man pressures. You can come up with a million five-man pressures, right? NCA, all the stuff off of them. Well, then you have to, you have to then play, you have to call them. So what ends up happening is when you start building out an inventory, you start looking and you're like, wow, we've got a lot of stuff. Or you're like, we have like 10 calls. Is that really what we want? Do we have everything that answers what we need? Let's build out some different things. And I think, I think it's important to create an inventory. So then you want to weigh your inventory. Most coaches don't really know the volume of what they carry until they write it all out. You know, I think a, a great way to do this is with your staff is just put it on a whiteboard, go through everything, create your buckets, and then just go through every, we, we did this every single year when I was with Phil Bennett is that he would put it every, every year. Whether we added something or not, we would go through every single thing that we had created the year before and that we called the year before and we put it in a bucket. 
and we would go through it and I would actually write it down on a, on a, like a, a, a blank sheet of white paper. And then I would go create an Excel file off of that so that we could have it. So, but we would keep it on the board all year and we would add to it. And then I would add to it on the Excel sheet. And then the next year we would go through and we would actually write it out again. And I know a lot of people are like, well, why wouldn't you just use the Excel sheet? Because I think there's something in writing things down and going through it visually than it is uh, to just get the Excel sheet. I think when you put it pen to paper and you write it down and you go through it bit by bit, it really makes the volume uh, kind of stand out. Do we have enough? Do we not have enough? Are we overloaded in this? Are we you know, are we under, uh, you know, performing in this? Do we not have enough of these? Uh, and then you tie it back into what was efficient and what was not efficient, right? Maybe, hey, we ran a lot of cover one last year. We probably need to have some sort of non-traditional Tampa this year. Okay, how can we teach that? Where can we put those in? Do we create a different bucket within our system? And then let's have a couple of them. Because remember, this is a change up not your fastball. Uh, once you have an inventory, then you can add or subtract depending on need. And I think that's the most important part is everybody loves blitzes, right? Everybody, everybody loves blitzes. Find me somebody in football that doesn't like a, a good blitz, right? A nice clean blitz, man, that looks awesome. I love it. You know, a nice exotic pressure on third down. Everybody loves that stuff. But again, do you need 20 of them, right? You don't have 20 third and longs. You don't have 20 third and mediums uh, a game. You need to really think, how many do we actually need? If we need 20 of them, then great. Uh, but make sure that we're, we understand uh, that maybe we need to subtract here. Or, hey, we've got too much. We're making too many calls. All of our pressures are fire zones. Is there a way that we can create a half field zone? Or is there a way that we can create a trap two out of some of this stuff? Uh, some of, And I've talked to a couple of these coaches, uh, you know, especially in the NFL where too high is becoming more and more important to play from a middle of the field open. Look, we're getting closer and closer to 50-50. So a lot of these, these fire zones that people have been running, they're like, okay, what if we just called this, these particular family, this, these, you know, three or four pressures, these four, three or four, five man pressures, these are just too high pressures for us. We're not going to even worry about having them within the fire zone world. And, and, and a lot of times that just comes off of just, it looks good on the whiteboard. Uh, but then when we run fire zone uh, with this pressure, it actually doesn't work. We're better off in a two high, uh, too high. So the next step off of that is I think everybody should create a glossary of techniques required to install every call. Because here's the other thing that people forget is that people in the coaching world leave. I know it it, it kind of is, is one of those things at the college and the NFL level, everybody just kind of understands. It's like, you're going to be moving. Uh, you're going to change jobs. It is what it is. It's not that big of a deal. At the high school level, for whatever reason, everybody wants to stay for like 20 years. And that's just not, that's just not, possible so when you have people leave for different jobs you have people come in uh, from different places having that glossary of terms being able to hand them say this is the language we use this is what you need to learn here this is and give them that so then then now when you go into install and you go into getting kind of accelerating their learning process they are they are better understanding a lot of times it's just kind of learn on the fly in a lot of places i've been like that it's just learn on the fly there's never been a glossary uh in fact i sat down and had to make a coverage glossary at Midlothian because I knew that we were going to have uh, eventually these kids were going to leave and I needed and I'm glad I did because I've carried that glossary with me I've added I've subtracted I've changed the meaning of certain things just depending on where we are your install in year one again should not look like your install in year four okay so if you are going to a new program where you left let's say you were there for seven years you had man we had installed down pat i didn't even have to think about it you're gonna you can't go into year eight of that install in the first year of that program those kids don't have the the background they didn't grow up in that program they weren't seventh they didn't go seven through twelve in your program and they know those words like the back of their hand right like you so when you go to a new program being able to then go okay we need to whittle this down. We need to create a better install, I think is important. So again, let's go back to our Allen, right? 
then going and looking at the different ways that we have it. We're, when you're creating a playbook slide and you want to create visuals, having having visuals of what the technique looks like, having the call with what it is. So Allen, an A-gap cross dog sim. I'm going to give a picture of Josh Allen so that people have that visual cue. When we have the wedge, I'm going to show when we get a base block, it turns into a read pop. When we get down, down, it turns into a surf and a pin. What is a not look at the different techniques, wedge, knob, cop, three drop, cross, running back. I mean, these don't have to be clever terms. Like literally the will, you have the running back man to man. If he pushes weak, you go with him because we're playing quarters. If he goes to the strong side, you track him like you trace back on him. Like it's not that hard. And then you have, we have mod man, a man outside deep. We have a poach tag because it's three by one. So the backside safety knows he's reading the, 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 the tight end that's slotted, right? It's not solo where it's not active. It's poached. So it's flat foot. We're reading. We're going to travel with the tight end uh, sky and cloud or our sky means quarters. Cloud means to read or palms. We have all of that. And then you also give, give, rules so the d end away from the strength equals cop wedge to the strong to the strong call side wedge d end only drops if it's an obvious pass set money down right that's when we're going to do that so having all of these pieces is important so let's build an install really quickly so how do you build how do you go from all of this to build an install how many days do you these are the questions that you need to ask them how many days do you want to install i think seven is probably the most Three is probably the least, right? Define who we are. What are our base calls? What are our got to have it calls all game? These are the 10 things, 20 things that we've got to have in every single game. So we've got to know how to run them. That's where you start, right? Who we are, what are our base calls? That's where we start, right? Don't start with the exotic, the really cool exotic third down pressure because you haven't even got there yet, right? That pressure can be built as a five-man pressure dog, or it can be built off of a regular off-ball simulated pressure. You don't need to have the sexy simulated pressure with a pre with a clever presentation on day one. That doesn't make any sense. And a lot of times in a lot of these places, it's basically a helmet and you're in, in shirts and shorts. It's non-contact. I never understood coaches that don't want to use those acclimation days as just intensive teaching days. They want to just wear the players out instead of like, hey, let's keep them fresh. Let's move around. Let's play some football. But let's really let's let's mentally overload them with a lot of information. Or let's put a lot of the mental load in these first three days as we're not doing a lot of physical movements. We're not banging, right? So what will we run every game? Always have it. And then can we match with our offense? That's the other thing. In spring, a lot of times you just want to match with what your offense is doing. And I think it's important for the offense coordinator and the, and the defense coordinator and the head coach to sit together and create an install plan. Typically, it's going to be the offense. It's like, hey, here's the map out of our 15 to 18 practices. This is what it looks like. And then the defensive coordinator on the other side is going to go through and say, okay, well, we need, this is our must haves. This is our, this is our, you know, 15 to 20 things that we got to have. How do these match up? And let's build it off of that. Um, I think too, one thing that I always found was like, for instance, at the high school level, we see a lot of zone. So our base calls against zone are always going to go on day one. We're going to add the layer. What are our gap scheme calls? And then on top of it. So uh, for instance, like, our five-man pressure Baker, which is uh, essentially um, uh, Aranda's spike one rat or uh, Georgia's uh, Buddha, which is just a cross dog over the guard. It's really a four-man pressure, but you're hug rushing the other backer, uh, so it can turn into a five-man pressure. Well, that builds off of our Brady path and our DAC path. DAC is just a B-gap insert uh, to the field. Um, and if you're asking, like, well, there's no F in that, well, DAC is, is number four. I live in DFW. Our kids wanted to have Dak as one of the quarterbacks. So he's number four. That was our field pressure. I made sure to find it in there for him. So again, ask your kids too. Uh, so we would do that. And then we could easily add our Baker pressure off of that. And so then layer three, now we're going to add safety pressures, right? We're going to add our corner pressures. We're going to add any more of the combos. We're going to add anything that we want. Now we have our empty hot check. Like that's our day three. So essentially we're installing everything that we need in three days when we're in acclimation so that when we get to four five and six we're going over these calls i have a full laundry list of if we're playing football from third from the 30 to the 30 
I have everything I need to be able to call it. Even on third down, I can just call one of these. Like, for instance, Baker. I can call Baker on third down, and I know that's going to be a good third down off-ball pressure. I don't need to have it. Golf, which is just a gap pressure, it's plug, right? So the so we're going to plug our gaps. If I have the backer to my side, I hug rush it. If I don't have the running back to my side, then I'm engaged. It's hot. I'm going right now. So it's a, it's our kind of like it like Baker. It's a four it's a four man simulated pressure, but it can turn into a five man pressure. Like those are those are the layers that we have. So I have all of these that I can use, and I've also installed all of our movements in our stunts. I've installed all of our base coverages. Now here's the other thing: if you get to fall camp and that's the first time that you've ever gone over all this stuff then you need to whittle it way down. And look, I, I'll be, I'll admit it. I live in Texas. We had spring practice every year. We had summer workouts every year. We had fall camp every year. We had football school in the fall. Our kids probably saw our install at least at minimum four times, football school, spring practice, summer, and then fall camp. So by the time we got to our first game, they had at minimum seen our install four times. Okay. Now, I understand that that's not the reality for a lot of people, but you need to understand that there are ways that you can sneak in some of this install stuff, whether it's building blitz circuits in the summer with your changing. I always thought the COD stuff, change of direction stuff, why we were not doing, uh, why we were not doing football specific. Like for instance, a great change of direction would be like your edge pressures of working to the quarterback, working to the running back, being able to run that hoop. Like, why are we not working, working to the running back and then change the direction and go catch the running back? Cause he pulled the ball. Right. And I got to go tackle him or I'm, I'm going to work vertically. And then I've got to work down the heel line. I mean, how many times often do I have to work vertically and then I have to rip flat to something like, why are we not using those and change of direction worlds? Make the game, you know, take those techniques that you need them. And then those are your change of direction drills. I, I never understood why people don't do that. So spring versus fall, spring, take longer, but make sure you get everything in. I, you know, I asked a, a, a buddy of mine who was a defensive coordinator. He was a young guy, first time defense coordinator. Um, and I asked him, I said, hey, what's the one thing that you can tell me from, from spring practice install? It was your first install, how'd it go? Uh, and then what is the one thing that you can take away from it? And he's, he was like, get everything in. Just don't be that way. You have everything in on tape. It may not be great. It may not be a great shot. It may, they may, your players may mess it up the first couple of times that you run it, but at least you have it on tape so that you can build something off of that, that they can look at it each year. You can, you know, Hey, this is not how we want to do this. This is the correction piece off of that. Remember we learn through failure. We don't learn through succeeding all the time fall. Typically we have two weeks and then we're going to, we're into the game plan. So it's kind of like it, it's a little bit more accessible accelerated but again if this is the first time they're seeing it that's on me okay that's on me if that's the first time that they're seeing it and if it is the first time they're seeing it and i've been i i understand it there are coaches out there that i look man i don't have spring and then i don't see my kids that much in the summer or we can't do football in the summer that's fine whittle your install down build during the season and then focus on year two on how you can get this thing larger what are, that that that's when it comes down to our must-haves right how can we install our must-haves in two weeks that's what i need and then don't be left, don't don't let fall be the first time these players see the scheme, right? Find ways, whether it's loading cut-ups cut in the huddle, creating cahoots, creating quizzes, having them look at it throughout the summer. Because here's the other thing, you can have them look at the film, right? You can, and then track the way that they're doing it. Have something like, hey, look, uh, I need I need y'all to watch this and then I need you to take, you know, put it in a Google Classroom and then create some sort of Google quiz off of it. Yeah, get creative. You know, I've never had to be in a situation like that because we were going to get through this at least four to five times before we got to our very first game. Uh, just the way that Texas is set up because we have athletic periods, we have summer programs and, and we have spring ball and all that. But if you're not in a situation, get creative. There, there's no reason why you can't do it. So let's wrap it up really quick. Start small and build. Remember, think pyramids. Pyramids are large, but they're built with smaller stones. Language first. Are we all on the same page? I've been in. I've been in it. I've been talking. I get into coach speak mode. I'm using a bunch of jargon, and then I'm looking at my starting uh, sophomore safety, and he's looking at me like with the blank stare. Like, coach, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, stay away from jargon. I think that's the most important part. If you have to use jargon to explain it to other people, at some point you're going to run into somebody that has no idea what term you are. Try and find better ways of explaining it. Remember, players are not experts. Treat them as such. Don't talk jargon to them. Don't use your office jargon with them. They have no idea what you're talking about. If you do have that one kid, 
we'll talk to that one kid about it, but then everybody else in most of your meetings has no idea what you're talking about. Context clues and visual cues, use those, right? Create context clues in your play diagrams, in your film processes, create visual cues so that you can accurately uh, communicate with your players. Technique over scheme, cannot stress that more enough. Your techniques build the scheme, not the, not the other way around. And then same as principles and interchangeable parts. Use different techniques and different cues in other things to build other parts. That's how you can get creative and get things going. So I just want to say thank you again to everybody that stayed and listened to this whole thing. Uh, thank you again for listening to another The Art of X show. Make sure to subscribe uh, to The Art of X show wherever you're listening to. Rate and review. It really helps grow the community. Follow me on social media again. Twitter is at the underscore coach underscore A. It's match quarters on pretty much anywhere else that you social. And then again, subscribe to matchquarters.com where a lot of this stuff you can find uh, in resource form from blitz structures to uh, blitz design to coverages to DB 101s, how to play defensive back. Everything's on matchquarters.com. Thank you again for joining me and coming and learning the art of X.